Hey guys, thanks everyone who was able to make it out to the meetup. Uh, we had a good time, finally got to meet in person, got to meet you and your parents, so that was a really good time. So hopefully we'll, ab we'll be able to do this more often and uh, you can make some lasting friendships with some of the other uh, kids because now you know you have something in common, right? So anyway, I'm going to do a quick uh, recap of some of the things we talked about just so that uh, if you miss something, you have a chance to go back and review it. And for those of you who couldn't make it out, uh, you have something to kind of check out what we did. So I'm going to do a quick transition here. I've recorded this video a couple of times. Uh, I almost knocked myself out by almost dropping a computer. So let's give this a try. All right, so this was Computers 101. Again, just try to you know come back to some of the basics on you know what is a computer uh, so that as programmers, we kind of know how to interact with it. Uh, we know a little bit more about uh, it as well. And that, again, will help us. So some of the different components that we'll see are kind of in the picture. And it really depends on the form factor of the computer itself, right? So this is a desktop computer, but we could be talking about a laptop or we could be talking about a Raspberry Pi, a server, you name it. The components are probably there in one shape, one shape or form. Uh, they just might look a little bit different. Or maybe they're not required at all. And so you're not going to find it like the optical drive. Uh, I have one in my desktop that I'm recording this on, but I definitely don't have one on my laptop. And maybe I don't need it there, right? So again, it depends on how you're going to utilize the device. Uh, as we start to look at these, we may find commonalities between different systems. So regardless of form factor, uh, but we also might find that some systems don't have these at all. So are they really computers, right? And so those are questions we can start to ask ourselves. So what is a computer? Well, according to Wikipedia, uh, a computer is a machine that can be programmed to carry out sequences of arithmetic or logical operations automatically. So that would qualify uh, most of our electronics in some way, shape or form as a computer right? Well, that may be helpful, may not be helpful. I tend to say that, hey, a computer is going to have some type of processor. It's going to have some type of memory. It should be able to do more than one thing, hopefully at a time. Um, and there are different ways that we can interact with it, right? So in the case of like a Arduino, right? So I'm going to attempt here if my camera will work out. Execute. All right, look at that. That worked. Uh, this is an Arduino. This happens to be one that's made by uh, Elegoo. Uh, but essentially, they're they're all built off of a common platform, um, and they kind of all do the same thing. So if you can program one Arduino, you can program another, right? Um, and so, essentially, uh, I can program this through the USB port. Uh, it has a microcontroller on it. I can take a piece of software that I wrote. Uh, I can upload it to this thing and then interface through some of these uh, sockets and pins. Uh, I can interface those with external components, right? And so uh, that thing's going to execute whatever I wrote, right? Well, it's only going to execute the things that I wrote. It's not going to do that plus some other things, right? And so that's kind of where I draw the line of, can it do more than one thing? No. Is, is it kind of generic in that I can have it doing multiple things? Well, in the case of the Arduino, it only does what my one program that I uploaded to it. And so I tend to not consider that a computer, but at the end of the day, this the whole point of this is to kind of learn some of those common components, right? And so if I transition back to my desktop, cool, that worked. Instead, I have a different board. And let me, I guess I didn't have to transition for that. Um, although the focus isn't that great on my camera, this is a, uh, a Beagle Bone Black, right? And so it's very similar to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, but this has uh, memory on it. Uh, I can get external memory by putting uh, an SD card uh, in the back here. Um, and so 
this runs a full operating system. So this one's running the default, which uh, is Debian. And so it runs a web server. It does all sorts of different things. So I definitely uh, consider this one a computer, right? And so the Raspberry Pi kind of falls into that realm as well, where I can run a full operating system and it it's happy to do that. I can do multiple things at the same time. So I, I tend to consider that a computer, right? So going forward, there's lots of numbers that you know we may see when we're looking at these components. And you'll often see different abbreviations made. Um, and so we kind of need to understand a little bit about the metric system to understand what those abbreviations mean, what those numbers mean, right? And so if I have a single unit of something, it, it could be whether that's a bit, it could be whether that's uh, you know transfer, something. It, it doesn't matter what that one thing is. As soon as I get to a thousand of those things, I typically put kilo in front of it. If I get a million of them, I consider that mega. If I get a billion of them, I consider that giga. If I get a trillion of them, I put tera in front of it. And so when we start maybe thinking about uh, the size of our hard drive, uh, it doesn't make sense to think of it as a single unit, how many bits are on this thing. Uh, hard drives nowadays are definitely not in the kilobit or byte region. We'll talk about the difference between bit and byte. Uh, you may see something listed as mega. So I might uh, have something that says a thousand megabytes, right? But more than likely, when we start talking about storage, we're going to be talking about giga or tera. So we're going to say this hard drive is 500 gigabytes, right? Uh, so my main hard drive in the computer that I'm recording this on is is gigabytes, right? So I wanted a very fast hard drive, but it didn't need to be a large hard drive. So due to cost, I went with a smaller hard drive, but a faster hard drive. And so it's definitely in the gigabyte range, probably like 256 gigabytes. However, because these videos take up a lot of space, I need a larger hard drive to eventually store the video on. And I don't care that that drive might be a little bit slower, I just need it to be really large. And so it's in the terabyte range, right? So it's a one terabyte hard drive. And then I also have a USB hard drive that I can plug in that's for my real backups, and it's in the four terabyte range, right? So again, as we go up in these kilo, mega, giga, tera, we're just getting larger and larger and larger, right? And so that will hopefully make sense as we start talking about some of these different components. Another uh, unit of measurement we need to talk about is if I have a single bit in a computer, meaning that uh, I have a transistor um, and it can either be on or it can be off. And my tablet just crashed while we're talking, so I'll try to get that started back up. But if I if I can turn that that transistor on, you know, applying a charge to it, I'm now applying maybe a one to it. Whereas if I don't have a charge on that one transistor, I consider that a zero, right? Well, as I put all these transistors together to do something, right? I typically group them in sets of eight. And so you'll see byte referenced a lot of times. And that's nothing more than eight bits being grouped together. And so as we move forward, anytime we're talking about bits, you'll typically see that as a small b. So in the case of, of here, we have 56 kbps, that's kilobits per second. And that's like a transfer rate. So in the old days, before uh, we had Wi-Fi and all these different things. To get on the internet, we had to hook our computer to the phone line. And so we had a modem that would basically connect to that phone line. It would make a bunch of noise like <laughs> And your parents probably remember that quite fondly, but essentially that was transferring data from our computer to our internet service provider who gave us access to the internet. And then they would transfer data back to us, right? Well, the modem had to be rated in how fast it was. And so a good modem was a 56K or 56 KBPS modem, right? 
So that was a big deal to get onto a 56K if you had something that was slower before. However, when we start talking about uh, maybe our RAM in our computer, uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about it in bits because it's much larger. And so we typically refer to that as gigabytes. And so you'll see the B there for GB is capitalized. So we know that's a byte, not a bit, right? And so again, talking about uh, memory in our computer, it's typically in the gigabyte or terabyte range, right? Just had a bug fly by. Anyway, looking at computers again, multiple different form factors. We have the old stuff on the left. So in the top left, that is the ENIAC computer, I believe. Uh, and can you imagine that computers used to take entire rooms in you know in order uh, to be assembled and work? And so uh, essentially. It used a lot of early components like uh, vacuum tubes. Uh, and so again, you needed a lot of space, a lot of cooling to get it to do what it needed to do. There were a lot of patch cables. It's very difficult to get this thing up and operational and keep it operational, right? And so uh, we went from that down to something that there is at the bottom left. That's an old PDP. Uh, and so those were some of the original systems that helped tie what was considered the early internet, the ARPANET. So it tied universities together. But again, look at the size of it, right? Uh, so this probably also used vacuum tubes. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but, but again, components back then were very large and very limited. Now we move to the right side of the screen and up in your top right, that's a laptop that we're all used to seeing, right? So we went from vacuum tube technology to transistor technology. And so the transistor essentially made uh, computing much more efficient, much more reliable, and much smaller. And so we're able to pack a whole lot more capabilities into these small form factors that we couldn't do with the systems on the left. And then there at the bottom right, that is a, uh, a Raspberry Pi, right? So it has a lot of capabilities all built into it that you can fit now in the palm of your hand. But if you think about it, you have some of those same exact capabilities in your phone and you've been carrying your phone for quite some time. So again, we're gonna see that form factors are different, but some of the components between them are the same. So the first component we'll talk about is the motherboard. And this becomes the basically the central nervous system for our computer. So the picture you have there is for a typical desktop computer. And its main job is to tie various cards together, your processor, uh, your RAM, all these different components all together um, so that they can basically operate. But it doesn't have to be, you know, that form factor. Obviously, you're going to have some type of uh, motherboard in your uh, phone, and that's much smaller. But your phone is going to have a processor. It's going to have some type of memory that it has to interact with. Uh, it has various components that are tied into it, like your camera, uh, your cellular modem, all those different things, right? So it looks slightly different, but it its function is is very similar. And now. The motherboard also provides additional ports. So we see USB ports. This is an older uh, motherboard, so uh, we don't typically use that uh, green and that purple port there. We don't typically use that anymore. That's PS2. Uh, but again, it's providing capabilities to tie everything together and then be able to allow you to plug additional devices into it. All right? And if I flip, let me execute um, full camera. We'll give this a try. So I'm going to transition to that and I'll come right back. Earlier, I almost dropped this and that could have been bad. But essentially, this is a server that I have in the house. And if I kind of lower it down a little bit so that I can point to a couple things without dropping. Uh, we'll find that this whole board underneath all of this, that is all considered part of the motherboard. And that motherboard, again, ties all the components together. So we have RAM sticks up here and at the bottom. And then we have two 
uh, CPU, central processing units, that are covered by these uh, basically heat sinks to keep them nice and cool, or at least attempt to. You have all these fans that are going to blow air across that, again, to try to keep it cool. Um, but essentially, although this looks much different from probably what you're used to seeing in a laptop or whatever, um, it performs the same function, right? Uh, mounted to this, which you can't quite see, there are multiple hard drives. Again, all things that your normal computer does, but this just does it at a slightly larger scale, right? So let me go set this down, hopefully not drop it. All right, I'm back. All right, so let me transition back to my desktop. Now we have our central processing unit. So the central processing unit is like the brain for our computer. It's what uh, your computer or your program is executed on, right? This is, this is what takes the stuff that you wrote and it makes it a reality. It makes the system do something, right? And so we'll see that, you know, uh, it's typically rated in gigahertz, right? So we haven't seen megahertz processors, at least in a traditional computer in a long, long time. However, uh, what we did find is they got faster and faster and faster. And, uh, you know, the companies that build these Intel, um, AMD, you know, stuff like that, they were able to, to make smaller and smaller and smaller transistors, but it got to the point where going faster and smaller was getting really difficult just do the laws of physics, right? You can only make it so small. You can only make it so fast before weird stuff starts happening, right? Uh, where maybe it bleeds over into a component next to it. So instead, what we ended up with is instead of maybe a, com a single processor in your computer that goes super, super, super fast, they ended up making a processor that has multiple cores and to your computer system, it acts like it's multiple processors, right? And so on my desk here, if I open it up and let me try and let's see, desk cam, there we go. And we'll transition to that. What we have is, this is an older processor, right? Not super new but not super fancy um, or not that different from what you currently see. So it has a big metal portion here to the top and we would typically uh, put like this paste on the top of it. And that paste so that uh, would do a good heat transfer between the processor and whatever heat sink I mount on it. So think back to the server we just looked at. It has these big heat sinks. Because this processor, you know, as fast as it's going and as hard as it's working, it gets really, really hot. And so we need a way to bleed off that heat so we don't uh, ruin the processor. So that's what the, the top is good for. Is bleeding off the heat into uh, a heat sink of some sort. The bottom here has all sorts of different pins. So if we look at this one. This is very smooth. There's very, you know, little bit of bumps. And that's the interface between uh, the processor and the motherboard. But the one we saw in the picture just a second ago, and I'll kind of flip back to it, uh, it had individual pins. So you would line those pins up. They were basically, uh, it was a socket that would slide down into, you know, these holes in your motherboard, and then you would lock it in place, right? And so, again, that's how it interfaced. But essentially, this is a really old processor, and yet it had at least two cores in it, right? And so, from the perspective of my operating system, it would think I have at least two CPUs that I can use to execute operations. And so, it can have something different executing on one core as opposed to the different core. And now I can do multiple things at the same time. So if I transition back, uh, there we go. So again, we see the one in your picture uh, has actual pins. Uh, and again, that's just a way for it to interface with your uh, motherboard. And so 
uh, the picture there to your right or bottom right. And I know my video is kind of covering it up, but essentially you kind of see how it's there are different components in there, different boxes in there. And that's essentially showing you there are four cores in that thing. And so it operates as if it's four different CPUs. So even though we couldn't make it faster, um, we could make multiple cores in the same kind of box, right? Now, you know, maybe, I. it's definitely in my lifetime, probably not so much in yours, um, but we had 32-bit processors. Now, pretty much all processors are at least 64 bits, right? Um, and that's because uh, we uh, gained an efficiency with being able to move 32 or 64 bits of data at a time, right? And so as we start shuffling around data in and out of our processor, uh, doing operations on that data, if I move 64 bits in the same amount of time that it used to take me to move 32 bits, I've now gained an efficiency, right? Uh, I can move twice as much data in the same amount of time. And so most processors nowadays are 64 bits. All right, so now we talk about RAM. So we have a brain, we can think about things really hard, but we need a place to, to store those memories, right? And our RAM is, is kind of like our short-term memory. These are the things we're executing right now, the things that we're thinking about right now, right? And so those are our RAM sticks, and they're typically uh, rated in gigabytes, right? And so you'll typically see a... Uh, traditional computer have four gigabytes of memory or eight gigabytes of memory. Uh, I think the computer I'm currently sitting on is is got 32 gigabytes of memory. The server that I showed you before, um, I can't remember. I think that one has 24 gigabytes uh, of memory in it, right? So again, it depends what you're trying to do with it. Uh, your typical laptop. The STEM Club laptops that you know you sat on uh, this weekend, those all had eight gigabytes of RAM uh, in them. But again, this is where you know the things that we're currently thinking about. Uh, you know, this is where we store that data. Okay, so if you could see in the picture, there are different shapes uh, or different sizes, really. The stuff that's on the the right there is more uh, akin to a laptop. The stuff on the left is more uh, for a desktop computer, right? And so if I transition again, I can, oh, there it went. Uh, there are, again, different kinds of memory. So that's one. The thing to notice is this one has a notch right here. And this notch helps me line it up in my computer. And my tablet just died again. Go figure. Uh, it's doing a full reboot. Anyway, um, I have this notch here, and that helps me line it up in the computer so that when I go to stick it in the computer, right? So I'm going to slide it down on that notch, and it typically then snaps up and in place, right? But again, I'm aligning that notch and making sure uh, it's fitting correctly, all right? But again, they can be in different form factors. These are pretty old sticks that I got rid of in my systems years ago and for whatever reason kept a hold of, but at least now you can kind of get a feel for it. Now, again, that was more desktop uh, style, but I have an old computer here, and if I can try to get it, we can see that it has RAM. So I've taken the back off of this uh old netbook and what we can see is we do have a ram stick in here right and there are these little tabs uh that kind of if i pry them apart that memory kind of slides up and now i can take it out and so you can kind of see the the notch right there and so again all i'm doing is well other than getting my big fingers stuck in here I'm aligning the RAM and the notch, sliding it down in there, and in this case, it pushes down and in place, right? But that essentially makes it easy now for me to upgrade the RAM on this computer. So typically, a computer maxes out at a certain thing, maybe only accepts a, a certain size of RAM. Uh, this being an old netbook that 
you know, it's way out of date, uh, it doesn't get very big. I think maybe I can put two gigs of RAM in this thing and that's about it. Uh, not that it's really operational anymore. Anyway, uh, but for our demonstration, that's good enough. So since my tablet has still died, let me figure out. Uh, there we go. Let us transition. There we go. All right. Sounds like I need a new tablet. This thing is pretty grody old. Um, but anyway, so if I come back to this, uh, let's see. Yep, this is, again, short-term memory for the computer measured in gigabytes, uh, and we will move on. Hard drives. So our hard drive is more like our long-term storage, right? So if our RAM was the things that we're currently thinking about, the problem with RAM is uh, as soon as I take voltage away from it, it forgets about what it was thinking about. So I need a place to store something, right? So when I download a picture, I'll probably write it to my hard drive so that I can recall that picture later on. Um, in my oper operating system needs to be on the hard drive so that when I turn my computer on, it has something to go back to and boot from, right? And so we have a hard drive. And I brought an example here. So at the left there, you have a drive uh, that essentially shows you these disks in there. And so those disks uh, basically are magnetic disks. And the little arm that we kind of see has a, uh, it can read and write off of that disk. And so that disk gets spinning really fast and that arm moves to a certain point on the disk and can read some data from it, right? Well, we found that uh, in order to get it to be able to read and write data faster, well, that means we just need to spin the hard drive even faster. And so uh, in your cheap computers, uh, that thing would spin at 5,400 RPM. Uh, that's revolutions per minute. Uh, whereas your, your slightly better hard drives were uh, 7,200, I think, uh, RPM. Anyway, uh, so they would spin, you know, a little bit faster, which means we could read and write uh, to that hard drive faster. And if we needed more storage, uh, either we put more platters, uh, more of those disks in there, or we, you know, made where we stored the data even tighter together, even closer together so we could um, store even more on one disk. That also meant that the, the little arm that would read had to be more accurate. So again, as technology progressed, we could make larger and larger hard drives. But there's a limit to how fast we can make it. My server hard drives spin at like 15,000 RPM. Again, super fast, but again, I'm still relying on something to spin. And because it has to spin, it takes time to get up to speed. Uh, you know, maybe those motors go bad. And so on the bottom right, this is where we gone now. These are solid state drives. That's why you see SSD written there. And particularly this is this one is an NVMe. And I don't remember what NVMe stands for, but essentially there's a form factor uh, uh, that it's going to prescribe to. Uh, and in this case, this is a two terabyte SSD, which is probably not exactly cheap, but being that, you know, uh, technology progresses, it's getting cheaper and cheaper, right? And so my main hard drive in my computer is an SSD hard drive. It is a solid state drive, uh, which makes the transfer rate faster because I don't have to spin these disks up. Uh, I just have to read it from some point on this stick. And so it's much, much, much faster. And it's more efficient too. I don't need as much power because I don't have to spin. I don't have a motor that has to spin things, right? And again, as we're talking about these drives, we're either talking about gigabytes or in the case of this one on the bottom right, it's terabytes. So it stores a lot of, a lot of space. Um, so I'm going to transition back if I can find my mouse. And I have an example of a spinning hard drive. And this one uh, has a bunch of fingerprints all over it because, you know, we all got to have a chance. But essentially... You have these disks that spin, right? So this is gonna get spinning really, really fast. And then this arm is gonna move out to a certain portion of the disk. It's gonna read that data 
off of that stripe. Maybe then it has to jump out here and read this data, and then it has to jump out here and read this data, and then it has to jump back here. So it's constantly moving depending upon what you're trying to get off of your drive. And that moving around and that having to jump around the disk makes it slower. So in the old days with these style hard drives, especially with Windows, you used to have to defragment your hard drive, meaning, oh, at some point in time, I wrote some data out here, but there wasn't enough free space, so I wrote a little bit of it up here. And so you get data all over your hard drive. And if it's all over your hard drive, then this little arm has to jump back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, trying to read that data. And that would, again, slow things down. So you go through and defragment your hard drive, meaning it would say, oh, this data goes with data up here. Let me put that all together in this place over here. And that way, the next time I need to read it, it's all in the same place and it's faster to do that. With the solid state hard drives, because you don't have that problem, you don't have to defragment your hard drive. Um, and so again, another efficiency gain by not using these old spinning disks. But again, right now, these spinning disks are pretty cheap. But uh, solid state drives are, are you know, getting very competitively priced, but still not nearly as cheap as um, one of these old spinning drives. Okay. So that's enough for hard drives. So we had our CPU that this is how we're going to think. We had our RAM that was, these are the, 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 where I'm going to store short term kind of memory stuff. And now we have a hard drive, which is our long term memory stuff, right? Um, so let me go there. Now I don't have a GPU, uh, to show you cause the only one I have currently is in the computer that I'm recording on. Uh, and at the moment, they're really expensive, so the only spare one I had, I gave to a friend. But suffice it to say, the GPU is our graphics processing unit, right? And so this is what helps us display video, convert video, all sorts of different things. Anything dealing with video probably goes through your video card. Now, not every computer has a dedicated GPU like you see in the pictures here, um, like my laptop. My laptop, it's built into uh, the system. I don't, there's no dedicated card in there. Um, and so they save some space that way. They save some power that way. Um, and so your, your laptops can get thinner, lighter, um, and more energy efficient. Um, but when you do have a dedicated uh, GPU, again, it maybe makes it easier to play games, record videos, convert videos, all of those different things. If I, um, when I finish this video and I have to render it in a format for YouTube or whatever, uh, if I just did it with my processor where I'm converting that video, it may take an hour to do it. If I do it with my GPU, it will take maybe 15 minutes. So an order of magnitude faster uh, to do it on my GPU. Now, because they're, you know, good at these sorts of things and lots of people are streaming nowadays and because people have found they work really well with things like machine learning and the big one crypto mining um it's hard to get a hold of a gpu and they're getting really expensive um but if you can get your hands on uh, a decently priced one your, your computer could definitely use that bump uh in power now the bottom left we see there are multiple ports on this uh, GPU. And what we see is this supports on the bottom left, a uh, VGA, then in the center, that's HDMI. And then on the right, there is uh, DVI, right? And those are different display uh, technologies. So it depends on the, the kind of monitor you might have or the cabling, uh, depends on which one you have. So for me, uh, my GPU also has three different style ports that way. I happen to be using three monitors right now. And so I'm using all of those ports do, using different cables to the, to the uh, uh, different monitors. Okay. But your GPU has its own processor, which is why the bottom right one has these two big fans on it. It has to keep those nice and cool. Uh, it also has its own RAM. So as it's dealing with video and it's having to do conversions, it doesn't have to send 
uh, that data all the way back up to the main processor to get loaded into RAM. Um, it can do it all on the card, which again makes it that much more efficient. Okay, so those are the main components in our system, but oftentimes just having our system sitting by itself is a little bit boring, right? We want to get on the internet. We want to interact with our friends. Uh, we want to play games online, right? And so we'll have some type of network card. So in this case, the bottom left, this is a style of Ethernet card that uses either Cat5 or Cat6 cabling. Uh, typically, transfer rates are in the megabits per second, if not gigabit per second, right? So that was typically how we uh, connected our systems. Uh, and the computer that I'm recording this on currently is connected uh, via Ethernet, uh, cabling Cat uh, probably 5, cabling uh, to... Uh, uh, my wireless router because it was a faster transfer rate a more consistent transfer rate uh, for that however uh, it also has wireless capabilities and so you're going to see different form factors for um, for these uh, wireless modems and they're typically rated in the 2.4 gigahertz that's uh, the uh, amount of it's basically the wireless how fast it basically goes back and forth. And, and we can talk more about radio frequencies and stuff like that in the future, but 2.4 is a little bit slower than five gigahertz. And so uh, five gigahertz is something new within the last couple of years. Um, probably not in, I consider in the last couple of years, probably not so much in your lifetime, uh, but, it's, but essentially five gigahertz has improved improved throughput where it can transfer more data faster, um, but it may not penetrate walls as well as a 2.4 gigahertz modem uh, or wireless modem can. Either way, the bottom right shows a chip that might be in a laptop or maybe in your tablet, right? And that provides uh, those wireless capabilities. And somewhere, oh, here it is. Somewhere over here, I have an example of that. So if I transition, hopefully you can see that it's super small and my, my camera is a little bit crazy, so it's hard to see. But essentially, I'm going to line up uh, and screw this down. I got to line up these with some slots. What you can't see because it's so super tiny and I doubt my thing is going to focus. No, it's not going to focus. It's not going to play. Uh, but there are two very small attachments up on this corner and that's essentially where the wiring uh, for my antennas would be in my system and that's a little bit easier to see if we go back to the netbook that I had earlier so I have a wireless card in here so it's almost the same form factor but slightly different from what uh, I had in my other system so again they're different standards for these cards so you'll need one that makes sense for the type of system you have but essentially we can see the antenna wires coming off antenna wire coming off so one's probably transmit one's probably receive and those wires will end up running all the way up probably to the top of the screen so that they're up and away from all the other components so that they can be sensitive uh, to our wireless frequencies uh, that our modem is putting out. Okay. So again, that is there uh, to attach uh, to our wireless thing. But again, maybe in your desktop, again, different form factors. So let me go back. You might have a whole card dedicated to that. So this one has three ports that we can see here. And I can hook up, you know, three different antennas to it. And then this would plug into my motherboard and allow me to connect to uh, different uh, wireless networks. Okay. So again, depends on the system that you're using, what form factor you need, but essentially same capabilities. I'm trying to wirelessly connect to some other system. All right. Probably getting a little long on time here, so I'll try to hurry up. Oh, uh, we're towards the end anyway. Anyway, so we have our our operating or our hardware and that hardware needs to be able to talk to maybe the operating system that's running on our computer 
inside of our operating system, we've loaded different applications, and that's typically how we as a user are interacting them with our system. We interact with some application, that application is interacting with our operating system. Our operating system is then interacting with the hardware uh, that we just kind of discussed. And so, what is this? Well, there's a small little bit of firmware on our motherboard and I don't have a good way or I don't have a good example of it other than the picture here. But essentially, if I get my uh, mouse out, this chip right here we can see says Phoenix BIOS, right? And so this is the basic input operate or input output system uh, that is basically firmware that allows for our hardware components to talk, right? And so in our meetup, we had our laptops boot into BIOS and we could see where the BIOS allowed us to make changes to the hardware, like which boot device it was gonna look for first. Was it gonna look for our hard drive? Was it gonna look on our network card to see if it could boot from the network? Uh, what about a USB stick? Is it gonna boot from that one first, right? So the BIOS, at that real basic level allows us to interact with the hardware and kind of becomes like a middle layer layer between the hardware itself and the operating system that's going to kind of sit above it. And so sometimes when we're setting up a new system, we need to be aware of that because we're going to have to boot into BIOS to make some changes, right? So maybe again, we're changing uh, uh, the boot order that things boot up in, or we may be uh, changing um, how it's going to read from a hard drive because there are different standards, SATA or RAID. Uh, and so those things all kind of come into play, right? So I think this is basically, no, I guess we got one more slide. And that was now that we have gone from the hardware, our BIOS allowed us to interact with it. Now we have our operating system that we're typically you know, used to seeing uh, on a regular basis. So at the bottom left there, we had Windows. Um, the kids had a good time guessing what each of these was. They pretty much knew, right? So then we have Android. Some of us have Android phones. So that's running the Amber Android operating system. A lot of tablets are running Android. Uh, there in the middle, we have Chrome OS. So uh, some of our students have Chromebooks at home. A lot of the schools are sending out Chromebooks. Um, and so you may be interacting with your system through Chrome OS. And then there's the older kind of, or slightly older emblem for Apple. Um, so that could be running Apple uh, iOS on our phone, or, you know, like my wife has a MacBook Pro. Uh, so that again, runs Mac OS on that. And then nobody could figure out what this bottom right thing was. What? What are we doing with this uh, Penguin? Well, that's Linux. So the operating system that I'm recording this video on, the operating system that all of our STEM Club laptops are running, the operating system that was on the Beagle Bone Black uh, that I showed you from before, the operating system that's that comes standard on our Raspberry Pis, those are all based on Linux, right? So Linux was based on Unix, and you have lots of different flavors of Linux, all right? So we have our hardware, we had the BIOS that kind of sits between the hardware and now our operating system, right? And so this is where we're gonna write our applications. They'll interact with the operating system. Operating system will utilize um, not so much BIOS during uh, operations. It kind of does more of the setup work, but then it'll interact again with hardware, right? And that's our CPU, uh, our short, short term memory RAM, our long term memory hard drive. Maybe we have a graphics card, uh, and then all sorts of different components that we can plug in, like our network card, our, uh, you know, our keyboards, mice, monitors, you name it, right? So I'm going to pretty much end it there. Uh, this video has gone pretty long. And uh, I want to make sure, again, we just covered some of the material. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'll try to answer them as best I can or I'll have something prepared for our next meeting. So thank you guys for watching and uh, have a good day.